I wrote down uh, by way of an introduction to this section and at the risk of uh, dissipating the jolly mood that uh, came over us in the, last, uh, in the last grouping, my question is, how will the world end? <laughs> Who has a favorite way to go? Uh, will we go by fire or will we go by flood? And uh, will it happen in our lifetime or uh, will it happen at some distant imaginary future? Uh, Bob Hunter says that the movement for uh, environmental um, renewal uh, is having trouble because people don't really think that, uh, uh, well, climate control, that uh, global warming is a now problem. And so he's attempting to gain people's attention by giving it a date, 2030, and by giving it a rather terrifying name, Thermageddon. So, where's Bob Hunter? I can be light if I want, eh? I can be light if I want. I can, be, I want. Be, a little light, I can yeah. be a little light. Thank goodness. Um, the end. <laughs> um, I should say I started off uh, reading science fiction when I was a kid, um, which gave me a habit of thinking about the future. It also helped me avoid thinking about the present. Uh, which back in the 50s, of course, was, you know, any minute now some nut bar was going to press a button and we would all be nuked. So uh, it was a kind of an apocalyptic uh, era. Uh, I lucked out. I was, born in Win I was born in Winnipeg, too. Um, I'd like to say it was 1941. Hitler was astride Europe. Bombs were raining on London. And I was born in Winnipeg. <laughs> That's my <laughs> starting point. Winnipeg was a beautiful place because you couldn't be further away from any battlefield or front line on Earth. Uh, <laughs> We were almost, we were about 1,200 or 900 miles, something like that, from the exact geographic center of North America, the heart of the American fortress. Um, so, you know, in a situation like that, one of the glorious things, and all my uncles on my French Canadian side and my Scottish side, they all joined the Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and they spent a lot of time being among the many who trained the few uh, to go over and get uh, blown apart. Um, they all came back from the war without a single scar. I mean, my, my dad had, was a bit exhausted looking. He'd been smoking and playing cards and drinking with the boys now for six years. Um, and he got home, of course, and uh, suddenly there was mom and a couple of kids. Um, so it wasn't an easy landing for him. You know, th those guys uh, had to go through an awful lot of adjustment. Different world entirely. Um, I'm so used to talking lately, especially since this book of mine is out. Um, I should have brought a copy up and done a product placement thing here, but uh, having watched some of the masters at work, um, <laughs> I, I could learn, too. Um, <laughs> um, so I've been going around uh, uh, hyping the book and, uh, and, and, and giving my speech. Um, and it's a, a varied speech, depending on whether I'm talking to a group of students. The, the, <laughs> thank you. The product. The product. Close, <laughs> close up. <laughs> thank you, Moses. This is uh, there. That's how you do it, isn't it? <laughs> Good enough. So I've been going around talking about 2030. And I mean, I, in a nutshell, what it says is that, uh, and I, this is not me, it's, it's the thousand pages of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report. And it's a result of supercomputers working for the Environment Canada people. Uh, it's all the best science that the best scientists in the world can deliver. And I boiled it down into a quick little summary in, in English. Um, so that people could read it and figure out what's going on. And basically what they all say is that by about 2030, 2050 at the latest, the... Was, not oh, <laughs> I thought that I was like fast 20 minutes. Upstairs, oh, I so see, yeah. Be in the light a little more. I thought my, I've been on doing one minute, 20 second uh, <laughs> things for a long time. <laughs> 20, uh, 20 minutes. I <laughs> uh, started at the beginning of my life, go through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I've been going around giving this speech about how, uh, in fact, by about 2030, but 2050 at the latest, the Arctic ice cap will be melted. It's already 40% gone. Um, and at that point, uh, instead of an ice cap at the top of the planet reflecting the rays of the sun, our albedo, they call it, the reflective layer, will have gone and melted away, and it'll turn into a pool of black water absorbing heat, which will suddenly change the Arctic temperature. And something called thermohalian circulation, which is where all the great ocean, deep ocean currents start up in the Arctic, 
And if you change the temperature of the water there, it affects everything, because these things actually affect climate all the way around the world, for instance, emerging uh, just off the shore, uh, as the Gulf Stream, for instance, and as the wind blows over the warmer water in the Gulf Stream, it creates a temperate climate in Europe. One of the reasons, for instance, it's so cold over in Labrador. Um, all these sort of profound consequences to the melting of the Arctic ice cap, which is well underway and is caused by anthropogenic effects, is what they call them, man-made chemicals. Uh, if you look at the curves, they all start about 1750, uh, just at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we started putting up huge chim chimneys and smokestacks and belching CO2. You notice I'm going through this fairly fast because I made this speech quite a few times and I want to get to the juicy part. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so we started doing that, and at that point, the methane levels, the CO2 levels, the nitrates all start rising on what becomes an exponential curve in our time, and so does temperature around the planet. So it's now gone from there to on a curve. It's about here, and by the looks of it, it's going straight up. Now, the result of that could either be a superheating process, which we are in the early stages of, uh, forest fires burning everywhere, ice caps melting, uh, glaciers breaking loose, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I don't even have to go through the litany now. We all sort of know it. Um, all that is happening as a result of our activities, and if we don't change our course within the next 30 years or the next 28 years now, uh, my, my prediction is, and, and the scientists seem to agree, that thereabouts it'll become irreversible and will have changed climate uh, on planet Earth for the rest of, uh, of history. Uh, either precipitating an ice age which could last for millions of years, or worse, worst case, uh, a runaway greenhouse effect uh, which would turn the planet rapidly into something like Venus, uh, which has a surface temperature of about 200 degrees Celsius, a sulfurous hell. Um, so that's what the book is sort of about. Um, and, as, and as you can see, it's it, like nobody's laughing. <laughs> I, I'm not really trying to make any jokes. Um, it's a really grim scenario. Um, and in the latter part of the book, I finally get around to the good part, which is the discovery that, by the way, uh, since the problem is really simple, we're using the wrong, fo we're using the wrong fuel. We're using the fossil fuels instead of all the other alternative fuels that we could be using and we will be using in the future. So all we really have to do at a simple level to stop the climate from changing dramatically is stop using fossil fuels. Unfortunately, you're up against a trillion dollar fossil fuel industry that puts huge amounts of money into the coffers of things like the Republican Party of the United States and the Conservative Party in Alberta. With the result that the White House is controlled by the oil interests in Canada, I have to say, is sort of running around on the edges of things, uh, a bit like a chicken with its head cut off, uh, gibbering and making a lot of noise, but not even ratifying the Kyoto Protocol, which is the bottom line of what we need to do if we're going to have an orderly world transition to a kind of energy regime that allows us to continue on with this wonderful life we have without blasting, as we do now, seven billion tons, metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. That's a finite environment. You know, it's a no-brainer. You can't keep doing that forever. Okay, so that's the bad news. Uh, the good news being that the technology we need to make all these changes is right at hand, it's on the shelves, we just have to buy it, wind turbines, photovoltaics, hydrogen fuel cells, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not impossible, and it just requires political will, and I even see signs that that's starting to happen around the world, and even industrial, uh, the industrial sector is starting to respond by doing recycling, cutting down their emissions. Given enough time, we're gonna come out of this with a kind of a new hydrogen-based uh, economy, uh, and it will be a beautiful space age, a, a golden age, or something within our reach. And it really frustrates me that it's so hard getting there because it's so close and so doable. Okay, that's more or less the gist of the standard speech. But uh, this gender theme came up today, and I realized one of the things missing in my standard speech is uh, that I don't really talk about why this is happening. I sort of blame the, you know, the oil, petro-tyrannies, and the, Alberta conservatives, and uh, finally I even blame myself because I drive too much and I've started taking the subway and trying to redeem myself because I also was raised as a Catholic and I'm feeling guilty as hell. <laughs> um, and I say there's a, there's a case to be made for eco-Catholicism because uh, then we could all just feel guilty about what we're doing and try to do penance and, uh, you know, I'm confessing, for instance. Um, I think uh, penance, absolution. Actually, I could never figure out what absolution was, but that's a sidetrack. Uh, <laughs> In this situation, okay, so what is it? Why, why are we belching all these fumes? Why are we tearing the ecosystem apart? It is a gender question. Now, I happen to have lucked out um, by being not only born in Winnipeg, but being raised by my mother, who was a, a, a single mother um, back in the 40s and 50s when it was not fashionable yet, so to speak. Um, my dad, you know, couldn't take it after where he split, so I was raised by mom. Now, you know, the, the consequence of this was, uh, um, you know, I felt sorry for myself, oh, I don't have a dad, all my other friends do. But of course, I noticed as I went through my teens, my, my buddies were all spending all their time fighting with their fathers about everything, you know, 
cut the grass. No, you cut the grass, little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas my scene was, you know, sweetheart, could you cut the grass? Oh, mom, you've been working too hard. Let me cut the grass. <laughs> And then when she smelled cigarette to smell on my uh, breath, and instead of a big fight or me being beaten up, uh, she just said, look, I don't want you in the back lane, getting bad influences, hanging out with the bad kids that smoke. Here, have a matinee, smoke at home. <laughs> Whoa. You know, in fact, my mother and I had a tender moment on her deathbed as she died from lung cancer, uh, <laughs> where she did say to me, uh, Bob, tell me, did you ever smoke any of that LSD? <laughs> and I got to say, mom. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> um, the point is that years later, um, uh, you know, I, I got turned on to ecology. Now, I got turned on to ecology through a lot of different ways, being a Boy Scout, going camping, however it is you get turned on to ecology. One day you're sniffing a flower and you suddenly realize that Everything in nature is perfect and beautiful, and uh, wow. Uh, oops, there's a construction site over there, and there's a chimney over there, and a nuke here. Um, so I fell in love with nature. Um, later on, years later, I found myself actually starting to like, get really upset because I discovered that the whales were being wiped out or something. And the next thing I knew, I was volunteering to go and put myself in front of some harpoons or something to protect <laughs> a whale. Um, and there were moments in it all, I must admit, when I said, what? Um, what is going on here? I, I, you know, this is silly, this is dangerous for one thing. The other part about being raised by my mother is she didn't really urge me to go out and fight with people. Um, it was like, okay, I could stay at home, we could play cards or canasta, something like that. Um, uh, violence wasn't a, a big part of it and, and I didn't have to, she didn't make me sort of, if I had a dad around, I suppose I'd, we'd had to poke each other a lot and <laughs> wrestle and, you know, fight and, uh, but I didn't have to do any of that. Um, I think in a way what it allowed me to do is to get a little more into the nurturing sort of state of mind. Uh, I would suggest that maybe when we're talking about causes of, of the problems of, of overdevelopment and constant growth and uh, uh, construction of this and destruction of that, is that we're probably talking about a, a, a testosterone-based kind of consciousness at work. And there is another kind of consciousness in the world, of course, which is an estrogen-based consciousness. I mean, if Somebody said to me, you know, all seriousness, Bob, what's the quick fix to save planet Earth? You know, I would say, okay, an immediate mass injection program of estrogen <laughs> into all the males. <laughs> Calm them down a little bit. <laughs> um, estrogen isn't a bad thing. Um, the, uh, the fact that you might feel like nature and nurture, it's, it strikes me there's some connection. There's a very similar word structure, and maybe you should nurture nature. And I do know that in the environmental movement, what, what our real challenge is, is shifting from, you know, here's the paradigm word, but to get away from that paradigm, that testosterone-based paradigm that we have to go out and hunt uh, and tear things down, or even to build them up that much. Whereas maybe we get shifting around to the idea that we have to start protecting things, or maybe we have to nourish things, or nurture things. Um, now, this could get perilously close to a sort of a pious, you know, uh, latter-day uh, neo-feminist kind of thing that will get me, you know, a lot of favor with the ladies. Um, but, you know, the men will be looking at me contemptuously at the end because there's no intellectual vigor here. So uh, let me qualify this by saying that um, uh, when I say about an estrogen-based kind of sensitivity and nurturing and protectiveness, I'm talking about a serious, bad-ass kind of nurturing. <laughs> <laughs> and I can give you an example. Um, uh, sitting in the front row here is my wife, Bobby. And uh, she was the first woman in front of a harpoon. Um, and there's a little bit of a story here, and she's my hero. Um, and she's got the kind of uh, estrogen that I think the world needs right now. Um, for instance, that <coughs> we were going out to save the whales, and. Uh, uh, We'd been together for a couple of years, and she had been actually taking on the job of being treasurer of Greenpeace at a time when we were trying to uh, save the environment on deficit financing. <laughs> and our only assets were a couple of battered typewriters and an old Zodiac. And she managed to wiggle about a $190,000 line of credit from the ba Royal Bank. Now, it helped that the guy who was the loans officer thought he was a reincarnated Indian chief. Um, <laughs> and he gave us the money. Uh, <laughs> 
but she was the kind of treasurer that could roll with that. Um, <laughs> keep an army of creditors at bay. And, um, but anyway, she got sick of this after a while and being the, you know, the one holding the fort and insisted that she was gonna come out. And her line to me, which was irresistible, was, if you're gonna die, I wanna die with you. And I said, oh, uh, oh well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so off we went to sea, had many adventures. Um, uh, she actually took the trouble to get somebody to teach her how to uh, uh, operate a, uh, a note gourd engine, something that I, that my mother never taught me. <laughs> and, uh, too, too nurturing. Um, so she learned how to do that. And, and then finally we found the Russian whalers way out in the middle of the ocean and we leapt off our minesweeper into the Zodiac, Bobby and I did, and, uh, and the engine wasn't running and somebody let the lines loose. We were now bobbing in the water, excuse the expression, and, uh, and I was just screaming. Um, <laughs> And actually, that's something else my mother used to do when things <laughs> go wrong. She'd scream a lot. So I was screaming, and Bobby kind of pushed me aside and <laughs> cranked up the engine, and off we went to get in front of the uh, Russian uh, whaling uh, ship. And uh, she was very tense, I remember, and uh, this is my second time, and I was just a bit hysterical. Um, and was, you know, second experience is never quite the same. You know, you've been in front of one harpoon that goes off. You know, you've, you've had the experience. You don't really need to do it again. Uh, so she was very tense, and she had a, a white scarf over her hair. She had long hair at the time. She had a life jacket. Um, She's a beautiful woman. Um, as we closed in on the harpoon, I saw these Russians there with their gun all in, and cigarettes hanging, and unshaven, and they were about as macho as you could possibly get. And uh, uh, as we were approaching, it looked like they were going to shoot again. And I really didn't like this idea, so I turned to Bobby, and with as much tact as I could possibly muster, using all my years of sophistication and the the lessons from my mother on how to treat a woman properly, I said, show them your tits. <laughs> <laughs> now, she gave me that icy death Vikings stare, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but then she got the message, so she took that off, and she actually took the life jacket off, and we roared in front of the Zodiac, and the Russians took one look at her, and they shut the operation down. That's the kind of nurturing. <laughs> stand up, Bobby. Come on, come on, stand up. Always wanted to do this. <laughs> Very good. And one last one about an example, further example of that kind of nurturing. Um, we were in Australia, and uh, the leader of our expedition was a young Australian guy who has so freaked out because we had discovered belatedly that the whaling station we were kind of closed down, most of the people who worked there belonged to the local motorcycle gang known as God's Garbage. And uh, <laughs> they were looking for us because uh, we were trying to, <laughs> to put them out of work. Um, so there was a tense period there and that finally there was one point there was a young American lady alone uh, picking bring up supplies and Bobby and our young Australian macho guy. Um, and he was so flipped out with fear that he wound up uh, beating up on the American girl, at which point my blushing bride jumped on him from behind, got him around the neck, and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> so that later when I showed up at the protest and I saw the leader of our group, my Australian guy, and he's all beaten to rat shit already. And I thought that, of course, the bikers had done him in and they were coming for us next, <laughs> little realizing it was Cinderella. So. <laughs> anyway, nurturing uh, with spikes. Um, but the other part is we have to get the anti-nurturing part out, uh, under control. And the only people that can do it, us testosterone crazed males in the 21st century, is us. And uh, I just think we have to, uh, we have to start uh, getting around to the idea that maybe there's nothing wrong with little nourishing, nurturing, protecting, all that kind of stuff that, uh, that the other kids that I knew when they were kids, their dads were calling them wimps if they thought anything like that. So I just say, you know, it's time for us to move on to the next stage of evolution, which is wimphood. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the popular view. <laughs> Mass. <laughs> <laughs>